everyone, and welcome back to Revolutionary Writings, a podcast where we drop the W and discuss the L's. My name is Alexander Chung, and I am so glad to see you guys again. Today, we have a very special feature, a direct blast from the past, a man who may need an introduction, John Adams. (laughs) And if you're wondering how we got him here, Let's just say I'm banned from being within a 50 meter radius of the U.S. Parish Church. <clears throat> Pardon me, young madam. Could you direct me to the nearest postal office? I must write to my wife post haste. Sorry, John. It's 2022. We don't do mail anymore. Get on Twitter. She'll be there. Excuse me? I don't believe you understand what I'm trying anyway, to- Anyway, today I plan some juicy questions for you that I'm sure my audience will love to hear. Let's get right into it. So actually, speaking of your wife, you wrote to her a lot. But what about the letter that laughed in her face when she asked for rights? What? I don't ever recall writing such a thing. April 14th, 1776, ring any bells? She asked to write letters more than a paragraph and to remember that women do in fact want their rights. April 14th? Ah, I see. You mistake me. During that time, I was unable to write my preferred pages due to my involvement with the Continental Congress. We were in the era of revolution and progress, and I, of course, made it up to her later on. Right, right. But more about the remember the lays aspect of her letter. She mentioned that men could be tyrants if they could, and your response was, and I quote, as to your extraordinary code of laws, I cannot but laugh. And this is my favorite line. You are so saucy. Now, John, why such an aloof response to a serious request? It all has to do with the timing of things. My wife, God bless her, was an incredulously independent woman. While I was off writing papers of freedom, she managed the books of our homestead. Hell, even tended the farm. But we must consider the climate of the American people. The idea of revolting itself was difficult, and it took a lot of convincing to simply begin discussing the Constitution. And we didn't even do that publicly. Oh, I see. So it was less because you thought the idea was infeasible, but more so that you knew it would cause an anti-constitutional sentiment? Yes, well, almost. As I wrote to James Sullivan, a Massachusetts delegate, The precipice of independence was not the moment to bring voting requirements to the table. I see. It seems this letter you've mentioned was written on May 26, 1776. Right, yeah. A large part of our discussion that day involved the feasibility of the vote and what the people would truly agree to. Will not the same reason justify the state in fixing upon some certain quantity of property as a qualification trusted by the public? So it's not only what you perceive to be correct, but it's also what the voters thought. But for you personally, didn't the fact that they were, well, women, have a part? In all honesty, mm, yes. Women were much too dependent on their husbands during my time. They relied on who that witch has attached their minds to his interest. They spoke and would vote as they were directed by some man of property. Although I'm not the biggest fan of how you wrote back, it's understandable in the climate. But next, let's look at another type of dependent. What about slaves, John? Now, we know you're one of the main founding fathers who were against slavery, but you're the only one who didn't own any slaves at all. Why was that? Oh, yes, slavery. One of the many topics my constituents and I never agreed on. Personally, I never condoned it. Of course. Several of the letters you wrote dubbed it an evil of colossal magnitude. I did not pause to consider whether my opinion would be popular or unpopular with the slaveholders in the northern or the southern. The institution of slavery shook me to my very core, but without support from the nation. I had to keep my nose politically out of it. But in those colonial times, how did you make do without slaves when everyone had a pair? Or twelve? So, uh, as we actually spoke of earlier, Abigail handled most of the household procedures, but because our houses were quite large, we often hired staff and rather than keeping slaves, we paid people. 
Someone who stayed with us throughout my life was John Friesler and his family, but with pay. We relied on them very heavily, and we never owned another person. Out of the main seven founding fathers, you are the only one to not own another person. It sounds bizarre on its own, but of all the framers, almost half of them own dozens of slaves each. Oh, <laughs> when you say it like that... Let's not go too far, Mr. Woman, but later. Let's speak more on the legality of slavery, though. Why don't we discuss why you had nothing in the works to get rid of it? Oh, well, of course. Well, for one. In Article 1, Section 9 of the Constitution, we as the framers made sure to place that limitation on slavery for peace between regions. While objectively, we didn't agree with it, the limitation only halted incoming slave trade, and it specified no prior to the year 1808. We had to place it quite a time from the initial drafting due to the already tense heat from each colony, even if we wanted to outlaw slavery. It seems that the phrasing of that limitation was only on import, was it not? Unfortunately, yeah. Forgive my crassness, but as the foundation builders of America, we had other things to worry about, especially the infighting between parties. Looking at you, Alexander Hamilton. Bringing slavery to the table that soon would have caused issues that we did not have the resources to combat. I see. It was another matter of timing. It seems to be a common issue for a new nation. It makes sense, for it was a time of fragile nationality. Why don't we go to a time with a bit more foundational support? So, 1797, you are U.S. President. Hard act to follow, but congratulations, John. No re-election, though. Why is that? What did you do that made the American people dislike you so? Oh, right. Always a twist of the knife. <coughs> but, alas, I will admit my choices of action did turn people against me. While I am a Federalist, I do recall certain moments during my presidency where I sided with the Republican Party. Mm-hmm. The Federalists were advocates for a strong central government and wished to upkeep economic relationships with Britain. Republicans wanted power to the state and had French sympathies, which meant they wanted to side with France during their revolt. These opposing opinions went hand in hand for the very rebel and war of France versus Britain at the time. Ah, one of the most crowning moments of my time in office. First, the Democratic Republicans wanted to fight for France, help an old friend. They're just like us, down with Britain. My Federalist cabinet wanted to side with Britain, and at first it was just economically, for trade, you know, a nation on its legs. But eventually, all of the anti-royalty sentiment in France kind of got to them, and it was against France. Both seemed infeasible to me with what little resources we as a country had. Was your final decision to stay uninvolved that unpopular? I have guessed that more people would be in favor of keeping afloat. What happened was we were on track to French war. After a failed diplomacy mission that ended in a fair bit of bribery, the cabinet was convinced we should take up arms and sail across the sea. XYZ affair? More like XYZ yourself out! <laughs> <clears throat> but before that could take place, I may have sent my own peace mission to stop our involvement in the war. Which, may I add, avoided all conflict. Well. Even though you didn't have the support of $10 bills base, you saved a lot of 10s for American taxpayers. Bless up. War was prevented. The economy was able to thrive due to my choice. And I feel not enough members of the cabinet or the public understood that. Now, why don't we continue down this path? End of your presidency, Jefferson hot on your tail. Ever heard the name William Marbury? Oh. Please, the judge appointment. Your midnight judge appointment spurred one of the most famous court cases, one that led to judicial review. The end result was very positive, but all in all, not a good look for you. Care to explain? That was a year of heated political isolation. With the momentum that the Republicans gained, I was pressured to balance it out with Federalist power in the three-branch system. And since the other ones couldn't really be tweaked, judicial needed some adjustments. Although the judges were a bit preoccupied with civil cases, 
Was it necessary to do so with the flooding of the courts? But the method you chose to execute this was a bit questionable. You're completely right. It was essential that we broke up the courts a little bit. But you must remember that a large part of me wanted to and had to stick with my advisors. The judges were much too trivialized with everyday issues, so I took away a seat and broke it off into much smaller courts. And my advisors, being federalists, would want to keep power in the system. And although a large number of my judicial appointees made it in, a handful of them never received them due to an interception from James Madison, Jeffrey's vice. And thus, the court case was birthed. You sound disappointed, but out of it came the Marbury v. Madison case, where the Judiciary Act of 1789 was created. It gave the Supreme Court the ability to issue rights of manliness to persons holding office under the authority of the United States, helping establish checks and balances, something you agreed with. In a way, your failure contributed to your goal and the success of America. But hey, enough with history. You're here in 2022. You see our government. Take a moment and cross-compare. Did things turn out how you thought they would? Ignoring the technologies, is this how you tended it, the government to be? Mm, I suppose. In the officialities, this was essentially my vision. Power dispersed, titles officiated, different people maintaining different orders. I was not expecting the further separation of beliefs and electives, but I'm glad to hear the abolishment of slavery and the independence of women. Abigail will be excited to hear. That reminds me, you voiced your frequent distaste on how separate the people became. In this way, do you agree with Washington on his opinion of a two-party system, where he reinforced that men under parties will subvert the power of the people? Ugh, yes. Far too much yes. I spoke to a man named Jonathan Jackson, who was another prominent Massachusetts politician, on the very topic. There is nothing I dread so much as a division of the Republic into two great parties, each arranged under its leader and concerting measures in opposition to each other. One of my greatest political rivals, Jefferson, ended up being one of my closest friends as soon as we both left office. Without these great political divides, we would have gotten along much better as the president and his vice. Ah, uh, the historians often called you the founding frenemies. In this case, let's take a further look at what you would have wanted to do, besides cut down on the beef. Would you have done anything differently? Which is more about your beliefs than more in presidency? Maybe gave more engaging speeches? In regards to my presidential actions, I did what I could. During the nation's very beginnings, we had a lot to, to work through. Regarding the choices I made for and against my party, I do not regret them. As I've said to my confidants post-presidency, I knew staying out of wartime was likely going to cost me re-election from all sides. But you kept the country out of it for the sake of the people? Indeed. But to answer your other question, people have told me how loathsome my speeches were. However, I was the president. I'm told I was a very conceited person during my time in politics, and this I will admit, this was nature to me, and it would be far too much to ask to change that. I do, however, wish I acted less on behalf of my party. Trying to keep the Federalists in power at the light of my defeat caused quite a stir. As we discussed earlier, the processes of judicial review ended up balancing the government, but completely, completely without, without my intent. intent. But all in all, the road to a successful country was a difficult one. I think we all know that much. Looking back on it now, though, I feel like I did the most I could with what situation I was placed in. Although some may not agree with my sentiment, they weren't the president. Well, thanks so much, John. I am so glad we got the chance to speak with you today. I hope our little talk has provided you, as listeners, with some insight into what one of the most influential founding fathers had to say about some of his most crowning historical choices. Oh, thank you. <laughs> You're much too kind. While I'm here, though, can we discuss what those deafening noises are coming from your... metal box? Sorry, Adams. The episode's out of time, which means our conversation's over. Back into the ground you go. Hold on. What's gonna happen Next now? Next episode, I won't be here because I need to take care of some business. But you'll be hosted by someone near and dear, so make sure to tune in. 
Our topic will involve another deep delve into the key groups of the American Revolution. But you'll have to listen in to find out who we talk to. Wait a moment, young lady. guys enjoyed that little song preview? If you want more historical hits, take a look at our profile for some insane music recommendations, such as Yankee Doodle, written by William Billings. Hello, our dear listeners. Welcome back to Revolutionary Writings, where we drop the W and go over the historical L's. My name is Stephanie, but if you didn't know that, leave. JK, please buy our merch. Alexander had some obligations to attend at the U.S. Parish Church, so I'll be taking over! Today, we have a special guest, a professor from Brown University, Alexandriana Chang. Boo! Oh, sorry, wrong sound effect. Hi, thank you so much for having me. My name is Alexandriana, but most people know me as Professor Chang of African American Studies. It's an honor to have you, Dr. Chang. What got you interested in the field? Well, we must admit that foundations of American history were largely built on the grounds of slavery. The realization that not many people understand the influence African Americans had during our beginnings led me to dive into the field so I could help others. That is amazing. And it's interesting you say that because discrimination is often learned, but the teachings that cause it often stem from misconceptions. But enough dilly-dallying. I paid you for a reason. But as you mentioned before, you majored and taught African American history at Brown. Slavery took quite a hot minute to outlaw. Tell us, how were enslaved people finally able to gain freedom? That's a question that's often asked, yet always surprises people. By 1778, many states, including Virginia, manumitted thousands of slaves who served in the Revolutionary War. When the states manumitted, or for those of you who don't know, freed their slaves, was it more of an obligation or as a token of appreciation for the labor that they gave? I'm sure many felt it as more of an obligation. After all, they did promise to free them after they served in the war, but some owners, like George Washington, willingly freed all of their slaves. However, that was rare. Right, Washington. But let's not forget that he only freed them on his and his wife's deathbed. Otherwise, they served him for life. I do want to say there were more common ways slaves became free, right? Yes, thousands free themselves by running away. In Georgia alone, a third of the colony's pre-war total, 5,000 slaves, escaped. Golly gee willikers, that's quite the number. What exactly happened to the thousands of slaves that escaped? Well, many of the colonists weren't exactly buddy-buddy with them. Even the laws made were worked against them, as Thurgood Marshall, the first African American to sit on the Supreme Court, stated, the Constitution was defective from the start. Defective? That is certainly one way to describe the U.S.'s supreme law of land. Certainly a way I can't fully disagree with. When the framers wrote, we the people, they excluded a law who were American. Could you tell us who they meant to exclude? Was it economic, religious, gendered? There was a lot of discriminatory practice floating around at the time. I could go on and on. Exactly. Which is why I think it would be easier to say who they didn't exclude. Rich white men. Facts. Facts. But speaking of the Constitution, I saw, or I guess I saw the lack of the word slaves. You would think when about half the delegates owned slaves, their most prized possession would be mentioned somewhere. That was actually the point. 
The word was purposely avoided by the framers because they knew it would ruin the document. Really, but ruin ruin its what? Its credibility? Exactly, because of slavery being inconsistent throughout the colonies, it was a bit contradictory to mention it. As you said, about half of the framers owned slaves, and half the colonies were, as I often call them, slave central. Due to the influence of slave owners, the Constitution has significant protections for slavery, like the infamous Three Fifths Clause, which three fifths of all other persons or slaves for proportioning population. And that was because Southern states wanted more population counts without actually allowing their population to have a say, huh? Mm-hmm. And now slaves were partially people. The turns and compromises. That were needed to satisfy the states in hopes of ratification were never in favor for slaves. Is that really a surprise, though? There's others like the late ban of slave trade in Article One, Section Nine of the Constitution. Took a few decades to stop shipping people over in disease boats. Yes, and all of these laws never assisted the African American community in getting a foothold in America. Not only was their participation in politics dampened, but they were forever labeled as property into a minimum time of thirty years. I hear a lot of limitations, which isn't surprising, but those are more targeted towards the ones that were enslaved. What about the Black Americans who were free? Well, by the late seventeen hundreds, there were an abundant number of free Black people living in cities like New York and Philadelphia. As well as the rural portions of upper southern states like Maryland, this resulted in the creation of a society with its own unique culture and institutions to arise. Their own culture. What was the process of forming one? Some of my colleagues from Oxford, James Horton and Lewis Horton, wrote a book on free blacks during seventeen hundred to eighteen sixty. They mentioned the first independent black churches and schools. These institutions provided a foundation for many Black community leaders, who later emerged in the eighteen hundreds. We all know how the white majority felt about those with darker skin at the time. Getting set up and creating their own communities, even with these hindrances, couldn't have been easy. What regions would we have seen this in? Oh, it definitely wasn't easy. Forget <laughs> the South for <laughs> obvious reasons. If we traveled a few state lines upwards to states like Pennsylvania, we would have seen much more support for Black communities. Up north, where the farmlands grew sparse, screw corn. <laughs> These states had practices that legally freed slaves over time, did they not? How progressive! Well, in a way, but the process was difficult and filled with roadblocks. Free Black Northerners faced pervasive social discrimination. Most states did not permit them to vote, and many were informally prohibited from jobs. You can read more about it in the book *In Hope of Liberty: Culture, Community, and Protest Among Northern Free Blacks, 1700 to 1860*. It's the same as the one I mentioned earlier. It was also possible for perfectly free Black Americans to be enslaved, correct? Oh, most definitely. There was a Fugitive Slave Act of sem. I. Almost oh, definitely, there was the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850, which required slaves to be returned to their owners, even if they were in a free state. Many people never bothered to check if some free African Americans were, well, free, often just throwing them back in. Even before the act, people were still captured informally. Now I. Do believe that slave owners offered monetary rewards for people who returned those slaves? Who needs morals when you've got money? <laughs> would this not mean that the owners would keep track of who they got returned? Oftentimes, not really.、Oh! As long as a person was physically able to be useful, the white colonists could care less. And hey, if you're a slave owner, who wouldn't say yes to more free labor? Citizens must have known that there were countless slaves escaping. How were people able to tell the difference between those who ran away and those who earned their freedom? 
even though they'd be returned regardless. It was extremely hard to tell, and if I'm being entirely frank, I don't think any of the colonists cared to see a difference. I would attribute the physical differences to things like clothing is what gave free black Americans a degree of safety, right? Actually, yes. But being considered a well-dressed for a free black person was near impossible. What was the reasoning for that? Was it a result of pre-existing systemic prejudice or something that was cultivated by the citizens? I would say it's more of the latter option. To make slaves dependent on their master, many colonies established laws, like the South Carolina Act of 1740, forbidding slaves from being literate and a crime for others to teach them. Even when they were freed, money never bothered to help them in fear of being punished. Oh, I, I understand now. Because a majority of African Americans were educationally halted, many people were unable to tell the difference between an escaped slave and a legally free black person over time. This led up to them avoiding anyone a shade darker than their own and just not helping, no matter who they were. Exactly. While the challenges African Americans faced were purposely created, they continued because of the stereotypes implemented on them. In the first section of the Act of 1740, they declare, and I quote, all Negroes and Indians to be slaves, with some exception like those who are mixed. Laws like these certainly didn't help the prejudice African Americans confronted. Now, I must ask, as a professor of African American studies, I'm sure you had to dive into the mindsets of the different perspectives African Americans had throughout history. We've discussed free African Americans and escaped slaves, but let's dive into different perspectives. Could you tell us how the African American view has shifted and changed over years? Like, how would African Americans from the 1700s react to present times? Well, over time, America has evolved into something very different than it was 300 years ago. Back then, they were considered to be below animals. I guess you could say they were the underdogs, underdogs. Ahaha, <laughs> uh -huh, right. Now, not only do they have equal rights, like voting, being able to go to school, get jobs, but they ha also have broken records across the globe. We have civil rights leaders like Martin Luther King Jr., professional athletes, world-renowned authors and actors. We've even had our first African-American president. A lot of history has been shaped by African-Americans overcoming their oppressors. Do you think if African-Americans knew of their future, of their freedom, they would have done something differently in the past? I think the question is less of would they have done something and more of could they have done anything. Maybe they could have tried harder to fight back their tormentors, but that's quite hard to do when your life's on the line. What really caused society to change was the people living in it. And sadly, they won't come until a couple decades later. Of course, because you can't change laws if one, you're not allowed to vote, and two, the people who can kind of hate you. And actually, speaking of, I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but I'm afraid our time together is up. Thank you for coming in and providing us information on one of the most essential periods of shaping American history. Of course, and thank you for inviting me over to discuss African Americans during the 1700s. I hope I was able to clear up some discrepancies people shared on the topic. You sure did. And that's why you get paid the big bucks. Anyway, in the next episode, we'll be analyzing a complicated and lengthy topic, something not very popular with 10th graders, the U.S. government. <laughs> Thanks so, so much for listening, everyone, and we'll see you next week here on Revolutionary Writings. Revolutionary Writings.